Uh, I think he's a fairly modest man. Um, Father Morgan joined the Pastor 12th Seminary in Queensland in 1986. Um, he was ordained in 1991 and he had appointments as an um, assistant priest and parish priest after that. He was appointed to the Bishop's Committee for Youth and Education. He was a parish priest at Richmond and he was also in Port Arthur in Tasmania at the time we had the 1996 massacre. I, I think you heard about a bit that in, in the US because after that massacre, um, small children were killed. It was, there was a lot of people, I can't remember, about 26 or so were killed. Um, and it made a, a huge change to our gun laws. Um, John Howard was the Prime Minister at the time, so he, when you had George Bush, so he wound back our gun laws really strongly and a lot of people had to hand in their hunting rifles. Um, my father had a hunting rifle and he said, well, I don't see why I should give it back, I paid for it. But um, anyway, Australia basically cooperated with that and um, we haven't had uh, a similar size massacre, I guess, since. Um, but I'm guessing to be a uh, priest in Tasmania in that time would have been a particular challenge. Um, he studied extensively overseas. In 2002, he enlisted in the Australian Army Reserve as a chaplain. So we have a military ordinariate that um, some of our priests serve in. Um, and three years after that, he was asked to enlist full time. Postings within Australia and overseas followed, including in Afghanistan. And we were talking a couple of years ago, our SARA club had a speaker from the military ordinariate talk to us. Um, we helped them um, contributed to the production of ruggerized prayer books that are covered in hard plastic and they can go into a soldier's pocket and they're meant so that you can cope with blood and water and dirt and everything, wipe them off and still use them. And they told us um, uh, they were asked for these prayer books a lot, not by the Catholics but by a lot of soldiers over there. Um, and um, I think one of us asked the question about what um, attendance at mass was like in Afghanistan and the um, priest said to us uh, that there are no empty chapels in Afghanistan. I think there's something about that immediacy of the prospect of mortality. Um, so apart from that, Father's a bit of an outdoors guy. He's an international alpine mountaineer and he has summited the north face of Mount Everest, which is pretty special, and has climbed on thousands of mountains around the world. And he has a aim to summit the highest peak of every nation and major territory in the world. So you might tell us how many you've got left to go. Um, Father has been entered as a magistral chaplain in the Sovereign Military Order of St John of Jerusalem, Rhodes and Malta, uh, which I think is uh, the oldest order of chivalry still working. Um, about 10, 20,000 people around the world? Sorry? Ten, no, I mean how many thousand people? Don't know. Yeah, 1091 it's dated from. Um, Father was recalled to the Archdiocese of Brisbane in 2010 where he's now Vocations Director of the Archdiocese, Director of Discernment at Canale House and at the Holy Spirit Seminary and also Director of Pastoral Studies at the Seminary. Um, he's written a book, it's out there on the, um, on the table and if you want to buy one you give the money to this gentleman down in the front, $20. Um, Father is very passionate about all vocations and developing an education and culture of vocation awareness especially to the Presbyterial Ministry. Welcome, Father. If anyone knows me well, they know I don't like to read a script, but I'm going to do that today because this is a keynote address for the conference and it's on Christ, the light of the world. I am the light of the world. But I'd like to ask you a question first. We heard today there are four states of vocation, so after the baptismal vocation we enter into one of the four states of married, religious, ordained, or single life. Put up your hand if you're married here. Have a look around everyone. Please don't tell me there's a vocations crisis in the church. Look at that. <laughs> Put up your hand if you're single. Excellent. Put up your hand if you're a religious nun or brother. Now we have a problem now, don't we? <laughs> Put up your hand if you're a priest or a deacon. Okay, now we have an even bigger problem. Do people not value priesthood, religious life? Do people think that marriage is better, priesthood is better, that I can't do that? All these questions, and what are we supposed to do with it, I'd like to tackle today. 
Today will be a rather challenging and I hope insightful talk for you. But I'd like to pray. Almighty God, who will to be glorified in the saints, did raise up the blessed servant Juniper Sarah to be a light in the world. Shine, we pray, in our hearts, that we also in our generation may show forth your praise, who has called us out of darkness into your marvellous light. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who live and reign with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Reverend and lay brothers and sisters in Christ. Juniper Sarah, in a few weeks' time, will be the first saint of the Americas to be canonised on American soil. And of course he has been canonised extraordinarily by the first Hispanic Pope. The first Pope to speak the Latino-Spanish language as his native tongue. And a Pope who himself is an immigrant son. Our global village is an extraordinary coincidence, perhaps by design of the God of history. One such coincidence that I don't think many people have touched on is that while the dominion of monk Sarah walked up the west coast of the Americas founding missions in 1770, in exactly the same year, another explorer, Captain Cook, sailed and mapped the east coast of Australia on the other side of the Pacific in exactly the same year, 1770. These two men changed the world. They changed history and of course, in some way, they changed our church. The great lights of history dim against that light of Christ, the evangelization of the world toward the son of justice. Now evangelization is a trendy word we hear about, but it's not a complicated understanding. Why Pope Blessed Paul VI talked of new ways to evangelize. It was from the Latin American bishops in 1979 in their groundbreaking Puebla Conference document that we hear the term new evangelization for the first time in our church documents. The new evangelization is not a new gospel to be preached, but an adequate response to the signs of the times, to the needs of people living in today's social and cultural context. How do we encounter Christ is our context. New evangelization is simply an encounter with Christ that will inspire vocation. This encounter is what changes the world and enlivens and ennobles people towards God. Let us consider this encounter, this vocation in faith and this vocation discernment for today. Encounter is vocation. Pope St. John XXIII prayed at the beginning of the Second Vatican Council that the Church open the fountain of her life-giving doctrine which allows men and women, enlightened by the light of Christ, to understand well what we really are, what our lofty dignity and our purpose are. And finally, through her children, she spreads everywhere the fullness of Christian charity. Pope Paul VI, in his apostolic exaltation, Evangelini Mundiani, states, We wish to confirm once more that the task of evangelising all people constitutes the essential mission of the Church. Did you hear that? The evangelisation of people, our Pope says, is the essential mission of the Church. It is a task and mission which the vast and profound changes of present day society make all the more urgent. Evangelizing is in fact the grace and vocation proper to our church. Getting people to encounter Christ is the vocation of the church. Her deepest identity, Pope Paul VI there, our deepest identity is to have people encounter Christ. Paul VI said, our church exists in order to do this. Christ's encounter is an exhortation of vocation to live out one's call. Pope St. John Paul II proclaimed, the moment has come 
to commit all of the church's energies to a new evangelization and to the mission at Gentes. No believer in Christ, no institution of the church can avoid this supreme duty, even the Sarah Club. The duty to proclaim Christ to people. That's our deepest identity. That's who we are. You want to know what our basic baptismal vocational call is? That's it. To allow people to encounter Jesus Christ. Pope Benedict, during his homily for the Mass of New Evangelization, in 2011, St. Peter's preached, you are among the protagonists of the new evangelization that the church has undertaken and carries forth, not without difficulty, but with the same enthusiasm as our first Christians. And Pope Francis urges, get the smell of sheep on you, get the sourpuss frown off your face and show joy. Joy of the gospel. Evangelium Gaudium is in fact the encounter with Christ that brings us out of darkness into Christ's marvellous light. The Vatican document Gaudium at Spes says, number 22, Jesus Christ reveals humanity to itself. Our understanding of theological anthropology or what it means to be human and Christian informs the way we do missionary endeavour. This mission, according to the dream of Pope Francis in Evangelium and Gaudium, is not about self-preservation of the church, but about transforming everything, he says. Are vocations for the self-preservation of the church or for the evangelization of the world? Do we need priests so we can be nourished or priests so the world may encounter the nourishment of Christ who is light? And that is priests with religious, and all the laity exercising that baptismal vocation. Pulpits are for feeding, not for beating. How does that translate? I'd like to show you something that some of our American <coughs> brothers and sisters here, and those others from overseas, may find interesting. Every five years in Australia, there is a census taken of the Catholic Church. The last census was in 2011. Have a look at this slide. The Catholic population in Australia is 25%. One in every four people you meet at Coles is Catholic. One in every four people you meet on a bus is Catholic. I hope there's more than one in four people here Catholic. <laughs> in 1947, the Catholic population in Australia was one and a half million, and 63% of them went to Mass. I think we have some idea that 90 to 100% of Catholics went to Mass, before the Vatican Council? 63%, just over half. But look at that sad statistic. The population of Catholics in Australia has grown to 5.5 million and 10% go to Mass. What's gone wrong? In 2006 in Brisbane, that was the Catholic population. In 2011, our Catholic population rose but mass attendance dropped. Are people not valuing the Eucharist or our church gathered? Here's an interesting statistic. 53% of our young people, of Catholic young people, don't go to Catholic schools. They, in fact, go to state schools. 53%. Have we put energy into preaching to those young people in our state schools or our public schools? The Italians were the largest ethnic population of Australia until 2011. Filipinos are now the largest ethnic population in Australia. The largest age group in 2011 of Catholics, the largest block of Catholics in Australia, was the 10 to 14 year olds, who are now 14 to 18. The largest Catholic population in Australia is not our elderly, the largest Catholic population in Australia is, in fact, all of high school. If we're not concentrating in high school about vocation and about the light of Christ, something's wrong. Did you know, how long has Pope Francis been our Pope? Two, three years? Pope Benedict? 
eight years before that, no Catholic kid in high school actually knew John Paul II. All they have known is Benedict, maybe, but most of them have known Francis. Extraordinarily, that's what they think our church is. So our education of our lay people have steeped in our tradition of history is vital that they understand the church universal through the century. The largest workforce of the Catholics in Australia are not university students, they're in fact tech and trade. Now, just to the Australians, how many chaplains do you know are in a tech, trade or TAFE college? Zero. And guess what? Guess who the largest Catholic population of workforce of a particular job is? Concreters. That may have something to do with Italians more than anything. But... <laughs> and look at this. Women have higher qualities, qualifications than men. Catholics, more Catholic women have higher qualifications than Catholic men. But there are more male managers. Where's equity and equality? For example, this slide teaches us that young people, that Jesus is something they have and that they don't let us teach them to look at the bright image of Christ in the Eucharist or in each person that crosses their path. For do not we not pray each Sunday in our creed that Jesus is light from light? But neither do we need young people hoped up in an over-caffeinated faith. Neither do young people have a junior Holy Spirit. They have the Holy Spirit. They have faith. But how do we get to enlighten them, to bring that out of darkness so it shines? When Pope Benedict XVI addressed the Colombian bishops in 2006, he suggested that Catholics are converting to other Christian traditions at a rate of 8,000 per day in 1990s. Due, why? To the lack of fervour, the lack of joy and the lack of community they experience in the Catholic Church. This means they weren't converting because of doctrine, but because of a human need to belong and feel they belong. Nor do we know the retention rate of our Protestant churches, but my suggestion is their back door is bigger than their front door. How do we enable the light of Christ to cast across the pilgrim path of Catholics? who seem to be scattered more than gathered. And neither should we expect new seminarians to be pre uh, pubescent virginal angels steeped in the sacraments and the sacramentals of the church. Some don't know the rosary. Some don't know the mass or what it means to read scripture. But they are still called by Christ to be a priest. How do we call them out of the darkness into a light of vocational witness? How do we convey the church to them who are called to be priests, even though they don't know the church? What do we do? The question we ask is, what am I willing to do what God asks of me? May I offer you a few considerations. As a military man, when I was in Iraq, I went to a commander's conference and I heard this term for the first time, what's the bluff? I'm going to ask the Sarans today, what's the bluff? What is the bottom line up front? What's the bluff? And this is what I think the bluff is. Firstly, lead with the beautiful. The beautiful is less threatening. Most people want to bash everyone up with doctrine first. But our church has got so much beauty about it that we start with the beautiful, start with the saints, start with the social justice stories that are heartening and great, start with Caritas, start with what Sarah does. Do we know that in Australia that the Catholic Church is the second largest employer? For goodness sakes, people need to know that we are beautiful, not just doctrinal. Mother Therese teaches us that constantly. And once we are inside the beautiful, the experience of the church, that you can understand the good, the doctrine, and then understand the truth. 
This is the understanding of vocational call. Experience leads to goodness, that leads to truth. Second, don't dumb down the message. I get frustrated at my brother priests who dumb down the message to trite trinkets. We have it, it, a simple faith, but it's not a trivial faith. Young people want committed and knowledgeable people. People who understand their faith and know how to give an apologetic. To stand at the street corner and live that witness. We think deeply about issues. I'll tell you a story. I was in about 25 years ago in Joliet Diocese, just outside Chicago. And I was at a parish, staying a couple of weeks. And the parish priest said, would you like to come across and see our youth group? I said, I'd love to. I walked in and 300 young people were sitting on the floor reading the Bible and discussing it. Now in the 1990s as a young priest, I thought that was extraordinary, that young people would want to um, sit down and look at scripture, but they had a desperation to do it. We need to give it to them. For every action there is an opposite and equal reaction. Open a window and people may fall out, but that's okay. There are too many Catholic comic books. Did you know that? Catholics, you know, Catholicism for dummies and Catholic book. You know, like sometimes people may translate that to us being a joke, but we're not. We belong to the oldest intellectual tradition of the West. Thirdly, proclaim with ardor. How do we proclaim the message to the people, the agentes? Jesus is risen from the dead the basis of our faith. The modern Paul in Athens debate, I am for this, I am for that, I am for Apollos, I am for Cleos, I am for this. No, I am for Christ. The church has had 20 meetings, did you know that? Vatican II was the largest and longest ever meeting with over 1,000 people who met for four years. Some people think that's all we do. But there is a message of Christ with ardour we need to proclaim too. Church is a gathering, not a meeting. Pulpits, as I've said, are for nourishing, not for beating people up. Fourthly, tell the great story. Biblical renewal, understanding scripture, the great story from God who spoke to Adam and Eve right all the way through to Revelation is a wonderful story. And we proclaim that with ardour. It is a great story and it's truthful. Fifthly, we are a community. The greatest theological expression of our church could be, our heart is restless till it rests with thee. Actually, a lot of people translate this wrong. They say that Augustine said, my heart is restless, but it's our heart, he said. We're a community. Our heart together is restless until all of us rest with Christ. God is the centre of our world. We don't need to sit in a corner begging the world to take us seriously. We are serious. We have something to say to the world. As Bishop Hannah said yesterday, we have a right to speak to our world, whether it be about abortion, about marriage, about any issue. Don't silence me. What's the Catholic capital that we're investing in our society, especially with our young? And sixth, God's not in competition. I keep on saying this to young people. There's these movies out called The Avengers, and there's one of the Avengers is called Thor. And part of the Greek and the Roman pantheon of gods was they needed people to pray to them. When they prayed to them, they got stronger. I keep on saying to them, our God is not in competition. Our God doesn't need you to pray. God is strong already. He wants a relationship. A deep, powerful, moving relationship. <coughs> While I've taken a few choice words from the popes and an insight into people's faith life, this is not exhaustive, but only a snapshot of the exhortation to encounter Christ, to offer the steady drumbeat to pilgrims stepping into an ordinary future. As Sarah held his steady pilgrim journey into the unknown, so to our vocation proper, is to enable young people, elderly, families, the poor, the rich, priests, religious, bishops to step, 
solidly from darkness to light. The encounter from darkness to light is at the profound heart of our conference theme. Christ, I am the light of the world. Where Jesus in John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 12, calls himself the light that is to our world. I am, as we heard yesterday, is declared by Jesus seven times in the Gospel of John. Jesus declared himself, so we're going to need to pay attention. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and life. I am the way, the truth, and the light. I am the vine. I am the light of the world. The Acts of the Apostles witness that it is Jesus who turns darkness into light. In the beginning, there was darkness over the whole earth, and God brought forth the light. In Genesis, we hear the very first question that God asks to humanity. Do you know what the first question that God spoke to humanity is? He said, where are you? It's the first question God asked. Where are you? Adam and Eve did not answer God. They hid because of their nakedness and shame. But God called them. I was afraid and I hid in the darkness. The Hebrew Testament has given way to the Christian Testament. A new light of creation has brought forth. The new Adam, Christ, has declared he is the light of the world. What is amazing in this statement, I am the light of the world, comes just after a profound and pivotal story in the Gospel of John. A story that impacts our whole way of living, gives us a deep insight into who we are before God. Just before Jesus said, I am the light of the world, do you know what the story is? The story is the woman caught in adultery. A woman encounters Christ, caught in the very act that bring her out of the darkness of her bedchamber, probably naked or lightly clad. She stands before her accusers in the light of day and in the light of Christ. The law has revealed her guilt, they say. She needs to be stoned. What of the man? How come he never got caught? But let's concentrate on the woman. The law revealed her guilt. She needed to die. Jesus does an extraordinary thing at this stage. He bends down and writes in the sand. The Greek to write is griffin. But in the gospel, it says that he catagriffin. And catagriffin means he wrote down in the sand the sin of every man before him. Then Jesus asks, where are you? An echo of creation. God searches and wants to know where you are in proximity to him, the light. Jesus says, has no one condemned you? Then neither do I condemn you. Woman, go and sin no more. Or go be yourself a light to the world. You are the light of the world, says Matthew's Gospel. Therefore, our encounter with Christ brings us out of darkness and commissions us in turn to bring this evangelizing light of Christ into the world. Christ is the lamp of our vocation, a light until my pilgrim feet. For whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. This is the beautiful thing Christ says to the woman. You never walk in darkness now that you've encountered me. You walk in the light of Christ. To follow Christ is to live out our vocation, to walk especially in the light and to bring that light to others. We are called out of darkness to follow Christ into his own wonderful light and then to be a light to others. Is that not what vocation is? You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his own wonderful light. We are called out of restless darkness into light through encounter. We see God. The encounter story of a woman caught in adultery from John and Jesus' declaration, I am the light of the world, is the fitting climax to Jesus' public ministry. This is the end of his public ministry. He calls someone out of darkness and then says, I am the light. 
And then Jesus says in John 9, I have come into the world that those without sight may see. He then calls himself the Good Shepherd and his last act in John 11, he raises Lazarus from the tomb of darkness to light. Then the conclusion of John 12 describes the events of the Gentiles, the non-Jews, who seek Jesus out for the first time. They do not come simply to catch a glimpse of him, not to have some general audience, but rather to see him. In John's Gospel, seeing Jesus is believing. How simple, but yet how stunning is a request. They ask, Sir, we wish, wish to see Jesus. And then Jesus turns to Jerusalem and his passion. Throughout the entire scriptures, men and women have longed to see God, to gaze upon God's countenance, beauty and glory. How many times in the Psalms do we ask to see the face of God? Shine your face on us, on your servant, Psalm 119. Not only do we beg to see God's face, but we are told to look for it. Seek my face, says the Lord in Psalm 27. But we cannot seem to find the face we are told to look for. Jesus gave Peter the locks, the keys to the kingdom of God. I just wonder where the bloody locks are sometimes. <laughs> then the laments start to happen. Do not hide your face from me, Lord. Why do you hide your face from me, Lord? How long will you hide your face from me? We beg, we seek, but we cannot find God's face. Then we are distraught. Moses, speaking as a friend to friend, asked to see God's face, but God said to him, You cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. When we ask in the Psalms to see God's face, we are really asking to see God as God truly is, to gaze in the depths of God. In turn, we look for God and directly see who he really is. And then we are told in the last chapter of the book of Scriptures, the book of Revelations, Verse 22, 24, it is written, They will see his face. We see God's face revealed to us in the person of Jesus. How often do we long to see the face of Jesus? We are seeking his face today. What we do and when we do it, we will see finally the face of Jesus. One of the extraordinary compassion and solidarity is the days on earth of Jesus shared our flesh and blood crying out with prayers and silent tears. Jesus has been tested in all aspects like us, except sin. He knows our difficulties. He is a tried man. He knows our condition from the inside and from outside. Only by this did he acquire a profound capacity for compassion and mercy. This mercy is why Pope Francis has called a year of jubilee starting in December the 8th this year, so that all may come to understand the mercy of Christ. Mercy is the only kind of priesthood that makes a difference. Mercy is the only kind of religious life that makes a difference. Mercy is the only kind of married life that makes a difference. Mercy is the only kind of single life that makes a difference. When we read the gospel passage that the Greeks wanted to see Jesus, they addressed to Philip. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew went and told Jesus. To see Jesus, one must be led to him. I'd like to share with you some of my own story as a priest. This is a snapshot of me. I'm a priest, my silver jubilee is next year. I'm also a military chaplain for 14 years. And I'm also, as Anne said, a mountaineer. Now let me share your story. Some of the things people find extraordinary is I also have 14 degrees. I have a doctorate and four masters. I am a psychologist. Um, I've done a lot of being able to understand and do things in international relations with social policy. I've tried to understand theology and I've tried to understand the world and I've tried to understand it together so I can speak about our church in the world. I don't tell you this to show off. I tell you this that anyone can do this if I can. In 1996, as Anne said, I was the parish priest of Port Arthur. And as the parish priest of Port Arthur, there was a massacre happened in my parish. A gunman opened fire and shot and executed 36 people at um, Port Arthur. 
This here is my church. I was the youngest parish priest in Australia at Australia's oldest Catholic church, St John's Richmond. This is the church. Just beyond this is where the government opened fire. That day, my whole first communion class in my parish was executed. Do you know what it's like to lose your first communion class? Do you know what it's like for your parish to fall apart? The world was focused on us. The parish priest had done Blaine in Scotland, who lost his whole class at school four weeks beforehand, ran, rang me one night, and he said, I'd like to speak to the parish priest. And I said, that's me. It's three o'clock in the morning. What do you want to know? <laughs> and he said, Father, I'm the parish priest at Dunblane. I said, oh, goodness, Greg. He said, I've rung to tell you one thing. And I said, what's that, Father? He said, gather your people. Ignore everyone else and gather them. Celebrate the Eucharist no matter what they say. That's the memorial. And this is the minister's fraternal. The Uniting Church minister, the woman, the Anglican minister at the back and the Salvation Army minister and myself. The four of us became the four musketeers. Faith healed Port Arthur. They've written books about it. Don't underestimate our church in the world. I also, being a military chaplain, spent time in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in East Timor. And in fact, I was at Talil, which is in southern Iraq, for nine months at an American Air Force base with 10,000 Americans and about 500 Australians. They had no Catholic chaplain. They asked if I would be the Catholic chaplain to the Americans. And that was a hard job because I've had to write to many families and tell them about their sons and daughters who'd been killed. The Americans actually, I'm quite honoured by this, actually awarded me the Meritorious Medal of Commendation for my work there. So every time I go to America and I go through customs and passport, it actually flags. And they look me up and down and say, welcome to America, sir. God bless you. And I say, thank you very much. <laughs> but let me tell you a story. Just the next slide. This is um, me out with my boys one day. We're out patrolling. And my boys here have got submachine guns and they've got weapons and everything like that. And that's me on the very end. I've got a stick. And uh, I don't carry a weapon, although I'm proficient in 13 weapon systems. I, I actually only carry a stick because the young men and women, especially the young men, need to know that it, as I carry my stick, that life's okay. Because if I came out packing a weapon, they go, the Padre's packing, something's wrong. <laughs> the next slide, please. This is my chapel. I always got nervous at the camp because the largest building with the highest point was guess what? <laughs> and every evening between 8 and 10 o'clock the insurgents would send rockets into our camp. 17 to 21 rockets every evening they struck into our camp for nine months. And you'd hear it, two hours every evening to terrorise it. You know, they'd <whistles> bang. But they'd send them from 20 kilometres out and they'd always land one or two K outside the camp. One evening, or every evening when the air raid siren went off, we'd have to go into the bunker. I actually am not allowed to show it to you, but just to the left of the chapel is a square concrete bunker, and it has two pews in it, fits 10 Australian soldiers. And there's these bunkers all around the camp. One evening, the air raid siren went off, and I got put on my body armour and went into the bunker. And there were nine Australian soldiers there. And I sat down, and sitting opposite me, let's call him Pete, was a young man. He's about 21, 22. Huge young man. He's a bodybuilder. He can't answer a phone like that because of his bicep. He has to go like that. <laughs> and he looks at me, and he says, Padre, if I died tonight, you reckon I'd get to heaven? And then he looked down at his mates, as if almost to say, yeah, we'll get the Padre. And I looked straight at him in the eye and I said to him, no. And I remember he's a big fella. <laughs> and he said to me, what do you mean by that, Padre? And I said, mate, if you died tonight, you go straight to hell. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, mate, you are the most selfish young man I've ever met in my life. 
You treat women badly. Anyone who treats a woman bad is a bad man in my books. You drink to excess. You don't care about your mates. If a rocket dropped on you tonight, you go straight to hell. Then he looked at me and he said, Padre, what do I have to do to get to heaven? <laughs> I love that. It's the story of the rich young man. And I looked him straight in the eye and I said, Mate, if you prayed a prayer right now and you said to Jesus, sorry for all the crap in your life, and you meant it, and I rocket dropped, you go straight to heaven. Well, just then, cue Hollywood. Bang! The closest rocket lands just inside the camp. He looks at me and says, Padre, start praying now, mate. Start praying now, mate. <laughs> and I started praying. I mean, what opportunity does a priest get to lead a young man out of darkness into light? That a priest gets to talk to young men about Christ in the midst of a war zone. These are hard young men. And I pray. I pray they'd be men. I am sick of wussy men. I want men to be authentic. I want men to stand up for what they believe in. I want men to understand who they are, and women too. I pray they be men. I pray they look after their mother and father, their wives, their girlfriends and their children. And I pray that they would know the mercy of God. Well, about two weeks later, I met up with Pete. And I said, oh, Pete, how you going, mate? He said, oh, Padre, I'm no angel, but me and the big fella are OK. <laughs> And I went to walk away, he said, Padre, and I said, yeah, he said, thanks. Thanks for being the first man in my life to give me a kick and say, get your act together. He said, most people are frightened of me. Thanks. The light will never be overcome. Let me just quickly tell you a story of Mount Mary. This is... Um, the, the Patala, the Dalai, the Dalai Lama's palace in Tibet. And I went to climb the north face of Everest. So we went to the Patala, the next slide. And as I came out of the Patala, this is me here in the blue jacket, this little girl comes up to me over here. And she grabs my jeans and she says to me, Mr, 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 money, money, money. And I said, Dashi. Now, Dashi means rack off or go away in Australian colloquialism, but in Tibetan. She said, no, money. And I said, dashi. Do you know what she did? This little girl knelt down on the dirt in front of me and kissed my feet. And then she looked up those big, beautiful brown eyes and blinked. And I folded my arms. I looked down at her and said, you manipulative little girl. <laughs> so you know what I did? I knelt down in the road in front of her and I kissed her feet back. And I was kneeling and she was standing and our eyes met equal level. And she looked at me as if to say, wow, someone's treating me with dignity. And then she ran off screaming. <laughs> but, but we have to take time, not just give out money, although that's important, but to take time to encounter each other on an authentic level. This is the team. I actually, um, it's cost $75,000 to go to Everest, but I went there in 2003. And it was the 50th anniversary of the summiting of Everest by Tenzing Norgay and some New Zealander. And, <laughs> and I wrote to a number of climbing companies asking if they would take me. And I said, look, I'm a priest and I'd like to celebrate the highest mass in the world. And this American company, Eric Simonson and International Mountaineers, said, if you can get to Kathmandu, we'll take you. So I got to Kathmandu, they picked me up, and we went, and um, I was an assistant leader. We had 21 clients. And the next slide. This is us, some of us climbing up the north face of Everest through all these crevasses. That's me there, by the way. <laughs> um, then the next slide. This isn't she beautiful. That's Everest. And... Uh, Basically, that's where I celebrated Mass. And, and I don't know how we found out, but John Paul, uh, Pope St. John Paul II found out that I celebrated the highest Mass there, and he sent an apostolic blessing and a written letter to me congratulating me for celebrating the highest Mass in the world. 
I actually sent it to Eric, International Mountaineers. If you go to Seattle, he's got it in his front office. And um, when I got back, my Archbishop said to me, did you celebrate the highest mass in the world? I said, yes, Your Grace, I did. He said, about time you did a high mass. I said, thank you, Your Grace. <laughs> As the woman was led to Jesus, as the blind man led to Jesus, as sheep are led to Jesus, as Lazarus was led out of the tomb, these acts look to the fact that we are brought to Jesus from somewhere else. Christ is a light, the light of our vocation, whom we want to see. In considering vocation, especially the ordained vocation, we need to understand that this light needs to be encountered through a call to come and see. How do we discern the light of call? Harvesting, being fishers of men, shepherding, picking up the cross and following are all popular images of the call to ordained ministerial priesthood. But what may we need to consider is whether these images have been appropriated or misappropriated by the church for ordained ministerial priesthood at the cost of being wonderful images of discernment for every vocation of the baptised. Aren't we all called to be fishers, to shepherd, to pick up the cross and follow? Even the phrase discernment of vocation has priesthood written all over it. That's why I ask every time I preach vocations, put up your hand if you're married. We don't have a vocations crisis. We need to understand that vocation is not just about priesthood. The discernment of vocation for all the baptised is paramount for our church. We seek to discover what is called and what ministry we are called from the crowd of believers. Consecrated life of religious and married, ordained priest and deacon, and the single life. If this discernment perspective was encouraged, we could come to see that belonging to Christ does not negate all other relationships. Rather, Christian commitment makes all other relationships holier and happier. Standing within the crowd of humanity, we can encounter decisive moments of choice in our lives. At these crossroads, we ask the question, the question of, who am I called to be? Is but one question of the discerning heart. I use call to be rather than to do. At the heart of being human lies the breathtaking image that we are called to be in, not do in. The choice scenario is ancient as biblical call itself. Deborah leads her people knowing her unworthiness. Jeremiah is in shock at the feeling of being too young for such a task. St Paul's whole world is shaken and challenged. Sometimes it is shock and a sense of disbelief, like when Mary asks, how can this come about? There is a detachment when Jesus asks the disciples to leave behind and follow, or when Jonah just finally gives up and is spat out on a beach. The discernment of who am I to be is a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. This is a conversation in which God calls by name, asking one to consider extremely important things, not only for you, but for the whole of humanity. Sero te amavi, late have I loved thee. St Augustine said, why did I leave it so long? How come I loved you so late, Lord? Vocare. God calls. We respond. This is the imperative to understanding discernment. God puts upon every heart a way of being. We're not predestined to that, but God encourages us to be who we are in full understanding. Do you think there can be any greater love than being able to bring Jesus to people and people to Jesus? Said Pope St. John Paul II. Or the wonderful expression of St. Catherine of Siena. When you are where God has called you to be, then and only then will you set the world on fire. Quo Vardis, where are you going? Discernment is a sense of being, idealism, excitement about where you will feel you are called to be. The whole of creation is one great act of asking, where are you? Why am I here? Why am I alive? What must I be? None of us is alone in posing these questions. Humanity feels the burden to give sense and purpose 
to our life. Why did God put me here? What must I be for God? Why am I created? The future begins to be the present slowing as one cuts away. That's what the word discernment means. It comes from the Latin word discere, which means to cut away. Discernment means to focus. Through encouragement and prayer, discernment becomes a purposeful life stance towards acknowledging and responding to God's call. Secondly, discernment is purposeful and intentional. You can't discern priesthood and marriage at the same time. I wish more people would discern marriage, not just fall into it, as much as they discern priesthood or the religious life. Vocation has to be intentional, orientation toward a call, as any other vocation is. You must never think that you are feeling alone in deciding your future. You cannot discern in a vacuum. We are called to be witnesses of the paradox that Christ proposes. They who love their life will lose it. They who hate their life in this world will keep it. We have here the echo of Fra Juniper Sarah. Therefore, discernment is about recognising the measure of your success will be the measure of your generosity. We are called each in a different way to go and bear fruit generously. The Lucan image of the call of the apostles gives another image. Now this is important. Most people think that we're lone rangers, especially priests, that Jesus stands on a beach and calls us. But I love this Lucan image, that Jesus gathers all the everyone, and then he says, you twelve, this one, this one, this one, this one, you come stand over here. You be my disciples, you be my apostles, sorry, and you be my disciples. We're called from the crowd. We're not lone rangers on a beach somewhere. We're called from the crowd. And do you know what that gives a sense of? When a young man comes to me and says, I want to be a priest, I say, who called you? He said, God. I said, who in the community has asked you to be a priest? If you can't answer who in the community asked him to be a priest, I say, go away until someone does. Stop being selfish. Because we are called from our church community by God. Vocation is not an individual selfish act belonging to one person. If the church has not called you, then you don't belong here. In John's Gospel, we have also this understanding of being called from the crowd. Jesus calls Andrew and then goes and brings Simon to Jesus. Certainly Jesus shows himself sovereign in his call to Simon. But at his own initiative, Andrew played a decisive role in Simon's meeting with the Master. The community brought Simon to the Lord. Hence the discernment within a community is vital so that share in the priesthood of all are not given an idea that they're more special than anyone else. Priesthood is special, but it's not more special. Do we respond to this vocational gifting or not? Why have you made me thus? Romans 9. The call is, he who is calls us. Therefore, in the presence of vocation, we adore the mystery and we respond to the invitation. Yes. The yes is a personal acclamation. The fruits planted within. Consider this Vocation of the church begins with the discovery of finding the pearl of great price. However, before one sells everything and purchases the pearl, one must pray for the insight to recognise the pearl when she or he finds it. The discerner discovers the light of Jesus, his personal, his message, his call. If we are to discover the psycho-vocational process from this dialogue, it would be apparent that for some the initial response of enthusiasm is only an initial passing grace. Our Archbishop sometimes says, I think some people like the idea of everyone thinking they're discerning rather than that they actually have a call. Do we have a grace for this particular vocation or not? Let me show you some things. Just the next slide, thanks. Just the next slide. Here are some statistics from the Americans. And I love this because every couple of years the American 
um, vocation directors take a census. And this census says, of those encouraged young men to priesthood, parish priests are 67%. So priests need to encourage young men. There's something wrong with the species of priesthood that refuses to propagate itself or ask other young men to be priests. Friend, parishioner, mothers are 38%. I find it extraordinary every time I go and preach in a parish. A number of mothers come up to me and say, don't you dare talk to my son. I want grandchildren. As if by some magic I'm going to change them. Do they have a call or not, ma'am? Yes or no? Here's an interesting statistic of those who discourage young men from being priests. A friend or classmate, probably female, other family members, mother or father, 19% of priests discourage young men from being priests. These are the prayer practices. And I'd like to get that in a minute. So. Before I conclude, I'd just like to show you some things. As Anne said, yes, there's a book out there if you'd like to buy it. The young man down here in the front, Adam Burns, he works in my office. He's a prolific and a wonderful writer. He produces a lot of material for young people about discernment of call. And he's written this book called Draft. And it's about poetry and insights and, and his blogs. And it, it's a great resource for young people. And our Archdiocese is the first vocations office in the world to bring out a vocations prayer book for children. Not just on priesthood, but also marriage, single life, and the religious life. And there's colouring in, and, but it's geared towards primary school children. This has been very successful for us. If you wish to purchase any of them, please go and see Adam. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Sorry, yeah, there are books. Just, yeah. Be it done unto me according to your word. This was Mary's great moment of her vocation. The very possibility of the incarnation hung upon this moment when Mary's fiat, her yes, was transformation. Today is the feast of St. Alphonsus Liguori, who wrote a wonderful doctrinal thesis called the glories of Mary. And part of that was Mary's vocation to say yes is a transformational moment of our world. If we take the discipleship of Mary, we have then a person who has responded to the very yes to God's call. A yes filled with joy and trust. A yes that is backed up by the powerful acclamation to do whatever he tells you. This means listening to Jesus Christ, acting on his words, putting your trust in the Lord. Learn to say yes to the Lord in every situation of your life. This is Christian witness expected from those who discern discipleship and those who are called from the crowd to bring a light to the nations. This is a willingness like the Sarans to do what God asks. Pope Francis's homily, Saturday afternoon, May 4th, this year, during his mass at Rome's Pontifical North American College, he said, Blessed Juniper Sarah, Apostle of California, witness of sanctity. Pope Francis opened with the words, I have sent you to be a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. This was true also for the many missionaries who brought the gospel to the new world. Among these missionaries was Fra Juniper. His work of evangelization reminds me of the first 12 Franciscan apostles were pioneers of the Christian faith in Mexico. He and they, and like so many others, ushered in a springtime of evangelization in those immense territories from Florida to California, which in the previous 200 years had been reached by the missionaries of Spain. Cardinal St. John Henry Newman once wrote, Lead kindly light. Amid the encircling gloom, lead thou me on. Lead from darkness to light. Thus we pray for enlightenment to Christ in his spirit, who came to us in the form of fire and Pentecost. <laughs> Following their light, we look forward to the eternal light in God's kingdom, where all God's holy ones, the book of Revelation says, 
Night will know more, nor will they need lamp light or sun, for the Lord God will give them light. The call to Adam and Eve, the prophets, the kings, the psalmists, the apostles, Mary, the disciples, the gospel writers, the woman caught in adultery, and maybe the man too who was not caught, the patristic fathers, the patristic mothers, the church through the ages, Sarans and those discerning vocation, and the call of God in their life, Jesus says, come, walk in the light, for I have called you out of darkness to the ministry of salvation. For Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Amen and thank you. to take a few questions if you have some um, we'll put uh, the afternoon tea off and come back a bit later I think so are there any questions yes. can, can I just say one thing being in the army I was in the tank division for three years and I've gone deaf uh -huh. so okay. I just might There's need a microphone, a microphone here. Just, Margaret, just here. come up to the microphone if you don't <laughs> sorry I am slightly deaf <laughs> might be old age too <laughs> No Thank you, Margaret. I was just going to ask you, who is the person who gave you your call to your vocation? Oh, okay, that's a long story I'd love to tell, but <laughs> I won't spend, I'll do it short. Um, I actually left the church when I was 16. I thought it was a hypocritical crap. And uh, because I came out of Mass one Sunday as an altar boy at 16, and four women were talking about another woman viciously. And I thought, this is not the church I want to belong to. But I searched the world, I went all around the world, um, I lived in many different places and finally a priest yelled at me as I was walking to work one day and he said, Morgan, and I just ignored him, who wants to talk to a priest for goodness sakes, and I was walking to the train station and he said, don't you ignore me boy, and I said, yes father, what do you want, he said, come and see me tonight, and I said, no father, and I kept walking, I was living at mum's place and I got home that night and mum said, the priest rang, <laughs> the priest rang, go and see him, I said, mum, Yes, honour thy mother and father. Best thing I could have done. Because I sat with that priest for hours. Like my dad died when I was six. And I never sat with an older man and chatted to him. It was fantastic. As I was leaving, I said to him, he said to me, Morgan, I want you to think about becoming a priest. I said, oh, father, I'll have to ask my girlfriend that. <laughs> and he said, you go ask her. So I, that, the next night I was having a date with Magella, my girlfriend. And I said, Madge, what do you reckon about me becoming a priest? She said, yes. And I said, don't you love me anymore? She said, I love you heaps, but you drive me nuts. <laughs> Everywhere, every time we go out, you're talking to the homeless, the street people, the youth. You have too much love for one woman. Go and become a priest. So a priest encouraged me and my girlfriend encouraged me. <laughs> Father, I just want to thank you because uh, in 2012, we had a daughter that was serving in Kandahar, Afghanistan. And I know, I don't, I don't know if you were the priest, but I know that our military troops in the U.S. were uh, ministered to by, your, by an Australian priest. And Could one of those was my daughter. And so we thank you for your international ministry. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I will just say one thing to that. My heart breaks because we don't have enough military chaplains. And my heart breaks because there are young men and women for the last 10 years who have been in war zones in Afghanistan and Iraq who have not had access to the sacraments and have died. That is, that is disgusting. That breaks my heart. So if you know of anyone, we encourage military chaplains. Um, especially the Catholic chaplains, because our young men and women deserve the sacraments. So thank you to your children and, and any other children of the United States who have also fought. Amen. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm a 
Any other questions? That's okay. Okay, I will call on Max Spencer to propose a vote of thanks. Thanks, Max. Father Morgan Batt, I was privileged uh, in uh, 2012, I was up in Queensland and I knew Father was a good bloke because he's a fellow Queenslander. So I was, I remember ringing him up from Noosa. I was up there with uh, several friends that I worked with uh, over the years and we get together and, uh, and I said, Father, I'd, I'd like to meet with you and I went down on the, went down on the, on the, on the bus and met Father, uh, and I, I felt an immediate uh, rapport with him. And uh, he had a, you know, at that time I could see that, you know, he had some real specialness about him. And I'm a bit emotional from just listening to the talk. But I remember coming back, I was serving uh, in the first year of my three years as uh, president of uh, the National Board here. and. Uh, I know we're, we're thinking about this conference here in Australia and at that point I thought Father Morgan Bat, we need him to be our keynote speaker. And I remember talking to the board about it and uh, no one seemed to disagree so uh, very quickly once the uh, conference was confirmed, the convention was confirmed, I phoned Father Morgan Bat and uh, he said yes I'd, I'd love to be involved. And I never heard him speak. I know one of our uh, attendants here, Father uh, Mike Potter, uh, did hear him speak to the Men Alive group in, in Wollongong. And Mike came back and was raving about uh, Father Morgan Bat. So I thought, well, you know, there's someone who know, I know who has heard him, so he's got to be good. I've never had any nerves about how good you would be. And uh, I think some of the things, that, or a couple of things, were so much in your talk, try and write down to speak about all the things you spoke about would be impossible in this time, but I think the, uh, what you told us about our need to be involved with our youth rang home because obviously that's where we need to start uh, to advance our church. The second thing that really struck me was the fact that you said we need to not pray to God, but we need to have a relationship with him. And the other thing was, you said, we need to, to be being, not doing. It was just so much, Father, but I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of everyone here for your wonderful talk and the inspiration that you give us. And it's, it's just so refreshing to have a real honest to goodness priest amongst us. Uh, you know, we've heard several this week, this weekend so far, and it's just, you just added to the flavour that I think has been a, a wonderful convention. So thank you so much. And we ask you. <laughs> God bless you, Sarahs. Since we've gone a little over, I think we'll have afternoon tea till uh, 3.30, so if you can come back at about 3.30.